Hello, welcome to our webinar today on HIA of a Nighttime Economy. My name is Bridget John and I'll be your moderator. Today's webinar is hosted by the International Association for Impact Assessment, or IAIA. We are the leading global network on best practice in the use of impact assessment for informed decision making. Today's presentation is part of a webinar series that IAIA recently initiated. And I invite you to check out our website to view the recordings of a few of our more recent webinars. And you'll see them shortly here on the slide. Uh, we had several recently, and you can view them at www.iaia.org slash webinars. Uh, we've had some on empowering indigenous voices, psychosocial impact assessment, resettlement and impact assessment. Opening today is our next webinar, which will be on March 1st, and it will be uh, presented by Bryony e. Walmsley, one of our IAIA members. The title is intriguing. It's Lost in Time, the Black Hole Between ESIA Completion and Project Implementation. We will also be having a webinar in mid-March to discuss the overview of the proposed Canadian Impact Assessment Act. We will be speaking with uh, an official from the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency who will talk to us about that and then answer some questions uh, from our viewers. It will be largely a Q&A session, so it should be pretty engaging and very timely as well. We do have a few items of housekeeping before we jump into our webinar today. We are indeed recording the webinar and it will be made available to you afterwards. In a few days, you should receive an email with a link to the recording. There will be time at the end for questions, so please enter questions at any time in the control panel on the right side of your screen. There is a box for questions there, and you can put those in anytime and we'll uh, address those at the end. Also in your control panel is a pane for handouts. And if you click there, you'll see that there's, uh, you can download the slides for today's presentation, as well as any uh, a few of the other relevant handouts that Liz references today. Our presenter today is Liz Green. She heads the Wales Health Impact Assessment Support Unit. She's a registered UK public health specialist fellow of the Faculty of Public Health and accredited member of the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health. Liz has extensive knowledge, understanding, and practical application of health impact assessment, or HIA for short, and provides training and lectures about the process. She's worked on, advised, or quality assured approximately 300 HIAs of varying strategic levels, complexity, and topics. Liz presents at national and international fora, including the European Public Health Association Conference and the Faculty of Public Health in the UK. This presentation today was nominated as outstanding by listeners when she presented it at II's most recent conference in Montreal last May. And we're really pleased that she agreed to extend it into a webinar topic. So now I'll turn the presentation over to you, Liz. Thank you very much, Bridget. Um, no pressure there then, um, uh, although it was very nice to have been nominated uh, to deliver the webinar for you. Right, so Bridget's outlined who I am. Uh, I lead the Wales Health Impact Assessment Support Unit. And as part of our service um, through Public Health Wales, we provide support, advice and guidance to a wide range of organisations in Wales. And today I'm going to um, discuss with you uh, one of the health impact assessments that we helped an organisation to undertake. Um, it is a health impact assessment of a draft nighttime economy framework and I'll tell you what that is in a minute it's not as complex as it sounds and the HIA uh, work uncovered um, who that economy uh, and the framework to manage it would have an impact on how it would have an impact and what what could be done about it um, and the HIA itself was quite interesting and uncovered quite a lot of uh, new information to help um, the organisation to redraft their nighttime economy framework. 
So uh, the nighttime economy, what is it? Uh, there's no standard definition for it, but basically um, it's the activity that um, takes place between the hours of 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. Um, that can be legal activity and it can also be illegal activity. Um, there's no distinction between it. So it's anything that reflects that economic activity uh, between that time period. Um, and in the UK, because Wales is one of the uh, nations of the UK, uh, there's been a traditional focus on uh, what they call vertical establishments. So that's stand up bars and pubs for drinking alcohol. And the nighttime economy has mainly been focused around that. Um, anybody who knows the UK will know that there is a bit of a drinking culture and going for a drink or going to the pub is seen as a cultural and social norm. Um, and whilst it can be uh, a good thing in terms of socialization and have positive impact. There can be drawbacks to that because of the associated um, violence or the implications of people getting too drunk, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, in Wales, there is or there was a, a nighttime economy management framework, and in 2016. Uh, Welsh government, who were the lead authority for this, decided that they were going to redraft it and relook at it. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit now about um, what what happened and why. So the nighttime economy, as I said, it can have positive impacts and it can also have some ne negative implications. Um, this is a, a, a nice slide of people out enjoying themselves they've gone to the theater it's uh, across all age groups and population groups uh, and it's a, a, um, an opportunity to enhance your cultural and social well-being uh, socialize with those like-minded individuals or your family and you can have a good time Ditto, this picture depicts a family out and you can have access to fresh, healthy food. So in terms of health and well-being impacts, um, the nighttime economy itself can have some positive uh, benefits um, to be derived from it. But it can also have some negative perceptions and some negative connotations. Um, this is a picture of sex work, again, related to the illegal activity, um, but also there was very clear focus um, around the management of the nighttime economy around substance misuse and illegal drugs activity. But primarily in, in Wales, it was it was looked at as something to be controlled, to be managed and um, to really be enforced from a, a policing sort of uh, aspect. This slide here dis depicts somebody who's gone out, they've had too much to drink or they've fallen or there's been some incident. Um, and invariably um, it is associated with alcohol and being out uh, on the town of an evening. And you can see the impacts, the wider impact that this has had, not just on the person themselves, but on their friends, their family, the emergency services, and, and all those associated sort of um, knock-on effects. So HIA, why, why was it used? Why did we use it? Um, so I know some of you are quite um, advanced in your knowledge of health impact assessments, um and others may be less so so the definition of hia in a nutshell it it looks at whether a plan a policy or a framework such as the nighttime economy framework will have an impact on a population's health and well-being yes or no um in this case it did um who would it have an impact on so which population groups uh, uh would it maybe have more of an effect on than others. Uh, how would it have an impact? Would it be positive? Would it be beneficial? Or would it have detrimental or unintended consequences? And if so, what can you do about that? 
So could you maximize any positive opportunities? Could you uh, limit or mitigate for, for any negative uh, um, effects? Um, and the definition of HIA in Wales is very broad and it encompasses not just your physical health, but your mental, social, cultural well-being. And that's pretty much been driven also through a, a piece of legislation that is unique to Wales and it's called the Wellbeing of the Future Generations Act. And um, that act puts an onus on public bodies in Wales to strive to maximise um, what they're doing uh, on, for people's well-being. And uh, there are seven well-being goals that um, people have to try and maximise and strive to maximise. And two of those are relevant to HIA, one of which is health, so a healthy Wales, and one of which is equality, so a more equal Wales. And, and health impact assessment, uh, when it considers the impacts on vulnerable groups and population groups, looks at trying to readdress any of the inequalities that you may find. So this was the first ever health impact assessment of a nighttime economy in the world or a nighttime economy framework. It was based on both quantitative and qualitative evidence and data and a researcher was hired to support uh, the redrafting and the um, assessment of the nighttime economy framework. Um, as it stood at the end of 2016. It was participatory in nature. There were two stages, two key stages, um, that encompassed three workshops um, across Wales and a wide range of stakeholders uh, participated. And that included from the criminal justice side, from environmental health, from licensing, trading standards, public health, emergency services, and we made sure that it was very, uh, very cross cutting and, and it embraced and en engaged with as many people as possible. It had an all Wales focus because the framework itself was to be applicable to the whole of Wales. And Wales is actually quite diverse in both not just its um, topography and its geography but actually the distribution of the population as well so there are um, there are pockets of urbanity with big cities and towns in the south such as Swansea and Cardiff and towns in the north such as Wrexham which are quite large have populations of students have a quite wide range of access to services and facilities but there are also very rural areas and a large coastline that um, uh, is primarily focused on tourism as well so there has to be some kind of um, understanding of the different nature of Wales as well and we felt that by holding it on an old Wales focus and the workshops across Wales we could try and engage with that diverse range of understanding of how a nighttime economy may manifest itself in different places depending on its population and its access to facilities and services. So the nighttime economy framework, the lead was a Welsh government um, and they were redrafting it. Um, it was led by the um, head of substance misuse and it was his department that were responsible for it. And we had very forward uh, thinking police and public health lead in Public Health Wales. And um, I was speaking with her and she said, what do you think about um, undertaking a HIA on this to help them redraft it and revise it? And I said, I think that's a great idea. Let's do it. So why exactly did we do it? Um, well, it made very definite connections to wider health and well-being and the implications for inequalities. Like I said, some vulnerable groups may be um, uh, more affected than others when entering the nighttime economy or working within it. Um, and it's a wide population. Because whilst most people might think nighttime economy framework, well, what's that got to do with me? Nighttime economy means nothing to me. 
actually, if you think about it, every single one of us, a part of our lives, will have been a part of or maybe worked within that nighttime economy definition. So if you go to for a drink after 6 p.m., if you go to a club, if you go to a theatre, if you go to the cinema, you're entering into the nighttime economy. Therefore, it does have relevance to you. Um, and I think that was very interesting perspective that once people realized that, then they were very keen to engage. Um, the nighttime economy framework as it stood had always been quite a, a reactive document and it, it took a very traditional approach to managing the nighttime economy. It looked at it as something that maybe had negative perceptions. So going back to alcohol focus, substance misuse focus, that kind of violence, violence prevention, enforcing laws, enforcing legislation, sort of managing and controlling it through uh, licensing laws and the way it was policed, rather than something that actually can be of positive benefit um, to a wide range of groups. Um, and that it would actually have quite a lot of beneficial impacts uh, for people too. And so HIA helped to look at the nighttime economy through a different lens and that it could be something positive and that there were some proactive measures that actually could be taken to make it much more beneficial and maximise those health and wellbeing benefits. Um, it was also the original nighttime economy framework was quite a dry document so it it laid out this is the legislation that you can use these are the levers these are the examples of when you can use it and the aim of the hia was also to try and find some best practice to learn from that so that you could sort of build in some prevention measures what worked where and how you could get the best from that um that framework and the way that it actually operated and the nighttime economy could coexist within with the population as a whole. And the aim was to try and develop a flexible framework that could be ad adapted to those different towns and rural villages and cities needs. So it would be much more flexible and adaptable. And you could use it in such a way as a toolkit for your different uh, locality. So, okay, to go to some of the findings. So who were the vulnerable groups? Who was who would be affected by the nighttime economy? And this is just this long list is um, just an example of some of them. So some are surprising and some aren't. So young people mainly. Some towns, for example, the town of Wrexham in North Wales, which is quite a large town, has a student population, but also a, a large um, uh, young population itself, um, was primarily aimed at 18 to 21 year olds. And that's not just students, but people of school leaving age who've just got their first job, they want to go out with their friends. And again, very focused on clubs, pubs, drinking alcohol, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, women, lots of safety concerns across all ages. Um, so not just young women, but women through the life course to older women who may have to go out of an evening, who may work after 6 p.m., who were working in some of the clubs or pubs behind the bar or cleaning or, or whatever. So there's a lot of safety concerns, not just for interaction with customers who may be had been drunk or those who were um, uh, presenting at uh, A&E services at the emergency department at the hospitals and they would have to try and manage that situation so it was across it was across a wide range of groups students um, this was reflected in the fact that many are away for the first time they may be not mature enough to handle sort of the peer pressure of a drinking culture that um, is quite prevalent in universities and colleges in the UK. Um, 
I've been there, I've done it, it took me years to get over. Um, I'm not proud of it, but I did engage in that. And I think many, many people do. And there is often peer pressure for people, oh, come on, you just want one drink, don't be boring, let's go out. So that was very, that came through quite clearly. Um, something interesting that came out was the, the impact that it, it could have on those who maybe um, have mental ill health issues or maybe predisposed towards that or, or, or well-being issues that may be fragile um, and going out into the nighttime economy uh, could either um, bring out some of those or it could actually exacerbate them and make them worse and that again is linked to the fact that the nighttime economy in the UK is primarily focused on alcohol, substance, um, use, etc. And that that can sort of have a, a detrimental effect on people and the way that they act and, and the way that they react as well to different things. Um, so some of the other vulnerable groups, I won't go through them all, but workers, specifically loan workers and bar workers late at night and transport groups. And I'll talk about that again in a minute. Um, but what was flagged up was that actually the nighttime economy can affect anyone in the population. So like I say, we all have engaged in it or we can engage in it at whatever age. And so you might not actually be defined strictly as vulnerable or think of yourself as vulnerable, but by entering or interacting with that nighttime economy, you can become vulnerable. And that just could be because you're in the wrong place at the wrong time when somebody is drunk or maybe explodes into a violent fight. So that became quite clear and that was quite interesting for us. In in terms of the sex and the gender impacts um, that were sort of quite specific uh, to, to the health impact assessment and the nighttime economy framework, we found that transport groups and particularly taxi, train and coach drivers, bus drivers, tram drivers, they tended to be older men and they were at risk of huge risk of significant risk of uh, verbal abuse and physical violence. And there was lots of reported incidents that came through um, because of this. So it had a very negative impact on, on them in that respect. Um, and whilst it provided economic benefits in terms of opportunities to, to uh, for work, some of the economic impacts could also be negative on them. Um, and that was because of passengers, I've used slang language here, doing runners, as we might have known it, and that's where they open the doors to the taxi, they get out, and off they, off they run into the night, and they don't pay, and therefore the taxi driver or the train driver, they may have to pay out of their own pocket, and it will have a negative impact on them, and obviously their families. Um, the economic impacts could also um, be articulated through the fact that some uh, passengers may be violently sick, they might have drunk too much alcohol, um, and being sick means that the driver will have to either clean it up themselves or pay for somebody to do it, or maybe get their cab valeted, and again that's got an economic impact on them. Um, in terms of male impacts as well, it was very clear that a significant impact, a detrimental impact could be on young men in the 17 to 35 age range. Um, that again included students, door men and women, but primarily most door people in, in clubs and pubs are our men and hospitality workers and again that was through the risk of violence, um, verbal attack, um, physical attack and the fact that they could end up in hospital or they might be trying to break up fights between clients and customers and again it would have a negative effect on them. Um, there was a group that was noted that were called strength drinkers and these tend to be men too. I'd never heard of this um, <clears throat> before. And it's a particular group who go out 
to drink as fast as they can and as much as they can to get drunk. Um, and the impact was not just on themselves um, because they became, you know, sub, sub, they, they could be uh, verbally abused themselves, but also they were seen as a nuisance group. So they were seen as they could be a nuisance or have an impact on others around them. Um, and then in terms of other kinds of gender, it was um, a verbal and physical abuse and those in the sex trade. Uh, and it was flagged up to me by somebody at the Centre for Equality and, uh, and Human Rights in Wales that this primarily could o o often affect um, tra transitioning people. So in terms of uh, impacts on women, so that was young women, um, students, again, uh, primarily in, in urban settings. There were some economic drivers and opportunities for them to, uh, like, similar to young men, to make money while they're student, pay for their way. But primarily, they were concerned about safety issues and um, the fear of sexual assault um, that could take place. Uh, young workers, again, waitresses, barmaids, hospitality groups, similar positive benefits in terms of economic opportunities, but negative connotations through safety issues, violence, that they could end up in hospital, they could be assaulted, etc. And one thing was really interesting about this and this group, and that is the over-reliance on technology and mobile phones that many women and young women particularly have. Um, we all have a mobile phone these days of varying types. It could be an iPhone, it could be all singing or dancing, wonderful technology, or it could be something basic. But invariably, they are not just phones. They are also methods of payment. If you lose your phone, you lose your method of payment, you lose your ability to contact your friends, your family, if you if you get separated from them, all your contacts are in there. It's actually, whilst it's a really fantastic and wonderful piece of technology, if you lose it, if you over rely on it, and you're in a nighttime economy, uh, situation that could be scary or you could have been separated from your friends then it can put you in a very vulnerable situation um, and that was really really interesting um, but it the nighttime economy also is relevant for a lot of other groups and a lot of many mixed groups mixed population groups and that transacts age and um, social status everything geographical and social communities and it became quite clear um, as we were working through this that um, there were a little available for older people for example or they considered it there to be little available for them in a nighttime economy because it's all about drinking there may be restaurants or but it's all by clubs and bars they didn't want to put themselves in difficult situations the same for young families or those going out with children um, they might not want to take their child into a, a city center and that kind of environment or they may not have the ability to travel to a, a leisure or retail facility and they might want something on the doorstep or nearby and it's not available for them um, there was also uh, very little for the under 18 age group um, and some of these things were flagged up and also the need that there were very different types of groups who would access different types of uh, nighttime economies so some of the the tourist towns along the coast in north wales like carnarvon they they needed to cater for tourists for locals they needed pubs they had seasonal people seasonal workers against big cities like the capital city cardiff which is regenerated has had investments as re vibrant has nightclubs sports facilities student centers and it's an all year round kind of economy and again going back to what i said earlier that the nighttime economy can affect all groups and you might not be classed as vulnerable but by 
entering it or being in the vicinity of nighttime economy activity, you can become vulnerable. Uh, some of the wider impacts we found, um, there were positives and opportunities for harm reduction. So prevention messages about preloading and, um, you know, that it's actually a benefit, it can be a, a wider benefit to you, mental well-being, social well-being, interacting with your family, interacting with your friends. There are opportunities for health promotion messages, not just about the dangers and the risks of too much alcohol, um, but also, you know, that um, you, could, you could actually have healthy food and access healthy food through, through the uh, nighttime and going out, that there was a positive role for town planners, and that was around licensing and about trying to get out positive messages about um about the nighttime economy maybe having a vision for it and sort of spreading the word within the local authority and their organization itself and that actually the nighttime economy can be a, a an economic driver and and can be regeneration and investment for some towns and it can help bring them back to life um negative impacts again alcohol food options are limited late at night sometimes in the UK it can be fish chips burger a kebab um, many might feel that the nighttime economy is not inclusive for them um, and that it's not anti bars and alcohol but just that there is a need for diversity um, with an increased numbers uh, of people accessing it you can have an increase in noise and environmental impacts um, and one of the things that was flagged up was that austerity and the fact that um, there have been many cutbacks in local authorities in Wales, it could have an impact um, on not, if you have a positive vision for a nighttime economy, then how do you deliver it if you haven't got the resources? And so that could have been an unintended consequence. Um, there was lots of talk of best practice and mitigation and maximisation of the nighttime economy and the framework itself could be changed. And this, the starting document to the final document are very different. And the aims and the objectives at the start for the nighttime economy framework were around policing, control, legislation. But actually at the end, they were around creating a diverse, healthy, safe uh, economy that catered for everybody. And so that was a really interesting journey. And all those that participated helped to shape that and shape those final aims and objectives. And one of the key things that came through was that there was a need for diversification. So, and it could be context specific and it needed to be an adaptable framework. It needed to be flexible so that people could use it in different ways, depending on where they were and what town, city, village, etc. And that it would cater for a wide range of needs. So not just bars and clubs, but restaurants, cafes, cinemas, sporting activity a wide range um and that some of the best practice was about learning from other cultures and the way that they en entered and used the activity um primarily from you know europe that was a, a key focal point uh, some of the maximization and the mitigation was around taking a proactive and preventative approach so stopping problems uh, and issues before they started and having a joined up uh, planning and evidence-based approach to the nighttime economy so if you have a big sporting event then as part of the planning that people got together and they discussed what what could be done what had been learned from other places uh, and then monitoring it and making sure that what was planned did happen and if and that learning from practice as well and some of the best practice examples were excellent that were flagged up through uh, through the hia and through the engagement and the participation uh, and that was around things like violence 
production strategies in collaboration with the security industry. So that goes back to relating to door people at clubs and bars and that they try to manage a situation or reduce it before it escalates. Um, things like street pastors and taxi marshals. Street pastors are actually groups um, of volunteers who are Christian uh, or come from churches and they operate in groups at night time till about 4 a.m. and that they can help uh, in practical ways. So get people to a taxi, get people back to their friends, help them find a, a phone that they can call their friends or look after people if if they're struggling. Uh, and so there were some really great best practice examples. So um, conclusion and the impact on the decision making. The HIA and the work that Public Health Wales and the um, Welsh Government and we as who did actually helped to pull out several key themes. That was that diversity was needed, it needed to be evidence based and that it needed to be able to be, the framework needed to be more appropriate to local needs. Um, it changed the aims and the objectives um, and the way that the nighttime economy was perceived by different partners. So the HIA lens and the health and wellbeing lens helped to challenge uh, the traditional enforcement approach, the way that it was looked at as a problem and actually became much more of a positive thing that could enhance people's health and wellbeing and the social and community life of a town or a village. Um, the HIA uh, influenced the final nighttime economy framework and that you can access that on the, on the Welsh Government website. And like I say, it revised and refocused its aims and its objectives. So from something that was about a problem and enforcement and legislation to something that was helpful Helping to create, create um, an accessible, safe, diverse, and healthy nighttime economy. And this is a, a diagram of the pathway that was developed by uh, Public Health Wales and Welsh Government to demonstrate how the nighttime economy could be of benefit. And instead of being with the enforcement being at the start of the pathway, it was at the end and it became much more about prevention and that can be policy as well as sort of practical uh, on the ground through marketing and taking social messages. So, so something in there is around minimum unit pricing uh, so that it can have an impact on the availability of alcohol and preloading from an off license and the journey this diagram depicts the journey through a high street or a city centre um, and all the different aspects to it and how it can be positive. So cafes, uh, the so sourcing of ethically uh, sourced and local products and food and sort of celebrating local culture um, and through sort of helping and supporting vulnerable people who may access that nighttime economy and understanding it more and then through to the enforcement. The health impact assessment report um, is published on the Wales HIA support unit website and there's a link there um, if anybody should want to access it. It's also included in your handouts uh, and as is the journal paper that we wrote. Uh, the researcher led on this um, and um, the uh, Health Impact Assessment Support Unit and the policing lead also contributed to it. And this was one of the other positive impacts that came out of the work that we did. Um, and that journal paper is also in your handout pack as well. So. Um, I hope you found that interesting. Uh, Diolch and Vauer for joining. That's Welsh for thank you very much. 
Uh, and if anybody would like to email me, there's my email address. And again, there's our website address for you to have a look and access uh, any of the documents that may be of interest to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Liz. It was a great presentation. We do have time for a few questions. Um, Alex is asking, how does your assessment overlap with or have input from psychosocial impact assessment? I think from the description um, of what we did, I think you can definitely see some clear synergy there, um, particularly around those mental well-being aspects. But also the um, positive implications um, for people's psychosocial health and well-being. Um, so a nighttime economy actually will have a lot of benefits for people and the actual impacts that we flagged up in the HIA could also be used in other types of impact assessments as well. So I think there's uh, quite a lot of relevance there and it can overlap. Great. Um, Niall says, thank you very much for the excellent talk. And he's wondering if it had been considered to quantify potential positive and negative impacts on population health in the economy. And if yes, how was it tackled? And if not, why not? Um, the data itself, in terms of quantification of data, it was based on uh, some of the data was around statistics, so police incidents, antisocial behaviour incidents, um, admissions to A and E through alcohol, substance misuse, violence. So it was that kind of of data, and there was a lot of evidence for that. There is a lot of evidence for that. Um, but again, it goes back to the nighttime economy being seen as a problem uh, of it having negative impacts. So what we wanted to quant, we couldn't really quantify it, but we could qualify it through the participatory workshops. And if people had data that they could share with, with us, then um, that was used. And, and that came through in those examples of best practice that we actually sought out. But a lot of the actual quantification impacts were around um, alcohol, substance misuse, violence, and they they all um, demonstrated the harmful effect or, or, or the implications and perceptions of a nighttime economy uh, in that respect. So that's why we took the myth, uh, mixed methodological approach. Ben wants to know how easily can this approach be applied elsewhere? I think it's easily transferable, easily transferable. I mean, health impact assessment can be applied to um, a nighttime economy framework or the management of a nighttime economy across all geographical contexts. I mean, it's a very transferable approach and actually Actually, it was very participatory and engaging and therefore it would flag up and highlight who would be affected within that local context and how it would have an impact on them and therefore what could be done. So how could you maximise any positives or mitigate for any, any negatives? Um, in Wales, the nighttime economy is focused or was focused primarily on alcohol. So, um, you know, it may be different in a different location that is much more of a um, not, not such a hardcore um, um, focus on alcohol and going out those kind of activities. And we have time for one last question. Liz, we'll try to get to the questions that were posed that we didn't have time. For, so thank you for all submitting them. Uh, Helen wants to know if if you know what the response of local businesses has been when being encouraged to be more inclusive. There's, there was actually um, a great appetite for it. It was very positive. I mean, some of that I did I did put in one of my slides that 
one of the unintended consequences was that some businesses, in particular bar owners, felt that the nighttime economy framework could be very anti them and anti them as local businesses and what they were bringing. So diversification was actually seen as a good thing as well um, because it would draw more people in and it gave them more economic opportunities. So uh, local businessmen were actually very, um, very engaged with this and were quite happy to because anything that brought in more diversity would bring more footfall into um, their paths and therefore could increase their own economic opportunities and, and their own businesses and what it generated and what it brought to an economy as well. Well, thank you very much, Liz, for a great presentation. And thank you all for being here to participate in the questions that you submitted. Uh, you will receive a link in a few days to the recording. And so watch for that. And also, when you click the link to go view the recording, there will also be an opportunity to sign up for our next webinar uh, at that same page. So just as a reminder, that's March 1st by Bryony e. Walmsley, Lost in Time, the Black Hole Between ESIA Completion and Project Implementation. Or you can register using the link that you see there as well. So please, you will, when you exit, you will be asked to complete a survey. We do ask that you just take a few minutes to complete it. It helps for us to have feedback. It also asks the question if you have any future webinar topics in mind. Uh, we'd certainly welcome those kinds of topics and feedback from you. So we know that your time is valuable. I really hope that this webinar was valuable to you as well. See you next time.